So my name is Nima, I, I come from Finland. I think uh, uh, alliance and whatever, whatever. Well, I would like to call us friends, at least today. <laughs> so I have uh, two parties to present. Uh, first, my uh, input, uh, the place I work, the National Board of Antiquities, and uh, then the place where I study, the University of Helsinki. I started studying archaeology in 1991 and uh, now in 2016, really making my parents proud. I'm still studying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really at the end of my PhD studies now. At least I would like to think so. <laughs> and the place what I'm talking about is, is this fortress in front of Helsinki, our capital. and. Uh, it's island, and uh, it has two names. Sveabori was the original Swedish name, and when we got independent, uh, we translated the name Suomeli. Of course, we don't know what it means. It means the castle of Finland, <laughs> and you can guess how many tourists we have trying to look for the castle. Well, it's not a castle, it's a fortress. <laughs> So the location, uh, I spotted Vilnius here in the map so that you would all know where we are. Because I really thought that I've been in Vilnius before, uh, back in 2009, and it was surprising that uh, Vilnius it wasn't on the seashore. And I found out that it was Klaipeda we were, we were <laughs> together with my colleague Rika back then. And I started to think that maybe the board would you know, save some money and next time they just put in a local bus somewhere. <laughs> a few years I would you know, Tell that I've been in Venice. It's a very, very lovely place, and I'm really glad to be here. Okay, so uh, the study site is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It was established in, uh, at least in 1991, and uh, you can see the borders there. It, it has equal amount of land and uh, equal amount of water area. But the difference is that uh, the water area is only protected from the surface. So they really didn't mind about the underwater cultural heritage back then. They didn't uh, like, like want to exclude it from the protection, uh, but uh, they just didn't think about that back then. And uh, the reason I'm not showing you all the old uh, maps uh, of this uh, fortress area is because we haven't had really good archaeological excavations uh, on land there. We started to do that uh, survey underwater, and uh, my goal has been that uh, once uh, once uh, they kind of got the idea how important and how interesting the archaeological point can be, so they will start to do excavations because there is a uh, like overpower of architects. And these architects, they really think that the drawings has all the answers. So I think they should be here listening to you <laughs> and see how interesting it can be when you take along the archaeological perspective. So. about the motivation to build the fortress and how to tell the story. There's a picture about a video game and uh, I think we kind of have a little bit lost it. I don't know how many of you play the Pokemon Go play. I do, that's the only <laughs> game I play, but uh, you know, it, it's a huge opportunity for us archaeologists to tell about uh, places uh, and uh, share, share the, the facts in an interesting way, so I think we should be uh, involved in this uh, game business with our own thoughts. But since uh, we like to uh, oversimplify history in order to make some sense to it, we like to say that uh, it was a political situation from Sweden to protect herself from Russia to make the decision to build the fortress. Well, it was much more complicated. 
Sweden got assistance from Russia to beat Denmark in October 1743. While the peace agreement was signed with Denmark, the problem was how to defend against Russia. And uh, Swedes need the alliance, and therefore the king, Earl of Frederick, married the princess of Prussia, Louisa Ulrika, Romans there. Everyone was in favor for this cooperation agreement, but permission from Russia was needed. Then again, Queen Elizabeth, Empress of Russia, led Sweden to know that this alliance could not be conferred before an agreement between Sweden and Russia. Yeah, complicated politics. At the end, Elizabeth did not support the alliance between Prussians and Sweden. She needed Sweden to support her son's demanding from Schleswig Holstein. And Elizabeth made a contract with Austrian Empress Maria Theresa to join the forces against Sweden and Russia. Don't get bored. And then again, Prussia reacted to join forces with France. England wanted to support Russia. This all created a little pressure for Swedish politics, and they had to decide if they wanted to follow Russian or Prussian friends lining. Well, Stockholm was a while highly interesting place in the Europe. It was a time of active diplomacy, and obviously Sweden turned to France. Since uh, Sverbori was built on French gold, at least there is a story uh, in the archipelago that there were several barrels of gold coming from France. And uh, at the end, it was uh, the biggest construction site at the whole Europe at that time. So, Sverbori, Suomen Well, um, I think here yeah, you have got the point that there it was a lot of controversial interest. And for me, it starts to sound like a soap opera, all the beautiful. And that is the question, what kind of stories do we want to tell? Do we want to say that it was a political situation from Sweden to protect herself? Or would we like to say something, something more? These are just questions which have been raised for me since I've been studying this area for quite some time now. And uh, I'm specialized in underwater archaeology. And now I'm going to show you a very short uh, film, how do we do it, and it's in Finnish. So I will give you the basic lines. Uh, in leading role, there's me and a fish, and uh, the, the lines goes like this. Where are you going? Go further. Hurry on, hurry on. <laughs> research diary we have uh, had the pleasure to visit several wrecks and uh, before this we only knew that there are wooden wrecks but not really uh, any timings for those. Now we know that there are the first vessels uh, of the army fleet recycled. <laughs> we have managed to identify some uh, wrecks from the Russian period. This is an unidentified wreck from 1788 or dendrosaurus dated to that period, so it's, it's been later on set on, on her site. And uh, I'm not really photogenic, I don't want to be in front of camera, but I'm a more lousy photographer, so I always end up doing this. Here we are marking the spot samples for dendrochronological dating. There was a previously a little talk about dendrochronology. Well, for us, if we get the dating results, we kind of trust them more uh, than the archival material. Okay. 
So this is something I love about my work. If you can do really different kind of things, you, you can really show all your talents. And that's the fish. <laughs> it was more shy than I. And uh, here, here is uh, one construction. This is uh, from a later period. It's from the Crimean War. And uh, basically, uh, if you think about how this fortress has been built, how the water area has been used uh, to protect uh, the fortress and the city, there are the main, uh, how do I say, <coughs> perhaps the most important is, is to close up the waterways. And it has been done with these kind of uh, uh, wooden castles and, and uh, vice governing old warships. Was this put together on the ice? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and then uh, yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that was uh, the way to build them. This is huge. This is like a 100 meters long and, and 4 meters high. So I don't know how they, how they did it. Do you put the stones in afterwards when the, the wood structures want to be sunk? Uh, well, my uh, understanding is that they, they, they kind of built the vessel and, and then they start to load it with stones until it sinks. But you can, if you need, you can always add the stones afterwards with an open water, but uh, basically you do them on top of ice. So uh, back to the back to the business. So we were we were diving in what uh, difficult circumstances. Uh, we chose to go there uh, during winter time because the water is more clear. You can see more. The visibility is better. And then again, there is no traffic because as we are worried so many nights in front of Helsinki, and there is a heavy ferry traffic uh, all the time in, in these uh, narrow straits. And uh, if we if we kind of insisted only doing this by diving, we would be still diving. But fortunately, we have uh, modern methods because uh, visualization it's it's really important because if you can see it, it doesn't exist. That's why we were happy to have this multi-beam sonar sonar scanning of the of seabed, so you can really see what's in there. And if we see it, it's not enough. It's always uh, important to show it to the public. And we had an exhibition. And when EEA was in Helsinki four years ago, we had a tour of this exhibition. There you can see the 3D, uh, 3D landscape and the way you could move on top of land and underwater. People were really pleased with this. So, uh, the importance of water areas. Um, there are several several layers of uh, results of my, my study. The, the study material was this survey material and additional uh, works in archives. You can understand that it's not really easy because you have the Russian material and you have the Swedish material. It's not only handwriting, it's always languages. And, and the material is spread on uh, different uh, countries. So what I learned is that the landscape is multi-layered and complicated to make interpretations. And this is uh, because of this politics in 18th century that they decided to build the fortress over there. So this is all because of that decision. So we have uh, created a deeper understanding of different activity areas and, uh, and some future plannings for archaeological excavations. Then True plans, they are just like the visions, ideas, of course. So we have the same problem as we all funding. And uh, what is quite important is that the underworld landscape is a cultural landscape. And uh, for me, it was about, I was studying recycling, and, uh, and I discovered that uh, there are not really shipwreck sites, perhaps two of them. 
most of the wrecks are there because they are recycled or abandoned. And uh, this is the type of work I kind of do alone. I have made it with my colleagues. Two of them are sitting there in the back row, very kind of bad. And of course, volunteer drivers. And uh, I have had additional financing because I've been on a study leave for my work as a maritime archaeologist. And, uh, and of course, the academic support from the Helsinki University. And this dissertation, Recycling Ships, Maritime Archaeological Aspect of So Many Nights, coming soon. And these boys, they are now 13 and 11. So <laughs> <laughs> time goes fast and you're having fun, right? <laughs> Thank you.